Welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Claudio Bravo. Uh, for those of you that don't know Claudio, he just joined the faculty in July, the heart failure transplant faculty. And I think that this is probably the, um, well, I guess Christina beat you in the quickest time from joining faculty to giving Grand Rounds um, by one week. But um, it's, it's extraordinary that he's able, he's giving us grand rounds today. Claudio has been a fantastic addition to our group. Um, it's already given us new insights into our treatment of heart failure, transplant and LVAD. Uh, Claudio was born in Chile. Uh, he went to um, college medical school university in Valparaiso, which is on the coast off from Santiago. Um, where after medical school, he had a focus in um, basic science research and that drew, drew him to Steve Vatner's lab uh, in New Jersey, where he did a postdoctoral fellowship, uh, which he's gonna discuss some of the work he did there. From there, he went to um, the Yale Bridgeport program for internal medicine training, to Montefiore for cardiology fellowship, and then on to um, Columbia for a heart failure transplant fellowship. Um, and as I said, it's been great. He's brought us some of the knowledge from Columbia, which is one of the biggest uh, transplant programs in the country um, to join our, uh, and now is on faculty. So I am going to let Claudio take it away. Thank you, April. Thank you uh, for such a wonderful introduction. And thank you also, Rob, for giving me the opportunity of sharing uh, some of the work I have done during my earliest stage of my career and uh, thank you to everyone for waking up early this morning to join to this uh, conference. Um, I'm sorry for uh, not very crea creative uh, title. I try my best to come up with something more sexy, but I couldn't come up with anything else. Uh, I try from the bench to the bedside. I think that was more appropriate, but that was already taken a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so uh, since I'm part of the UW family, I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity to introduce myself who I haven't met yet. I'm originally from Chile, as uh, April was saying, which is in the Pacific coast in, uh, in South America. And I moved to the United States around 10 years ago with my girlfriend and uh, currently she's my wife and mother of my two daughters. Uh, so let me introduce you my family as well. That's a picture that we took the day that we're flying from New York City to Washington in the middle of the COVID pandemic in June, 2020 to start my new job here at UW. Those, uh, those are my two daughters, Sophia and Emilia, and that's why my wife, Cecilia. So I'm from Valparaiso, a very unique, colorful and cultural city in Chile. If you go to Chile, I'm totally uh, I totally recommend you to visit Valparaiso, especially during the New Year Eve, that we have this spectacular fireworks show. I mean, this uh, the last uh, New Year Eve, we didn't have that because of COVID. And on the left panel you see of the screen, I'm showing you a picture of the place where I grew up. And that elevator, very unique elevator, was part of my daily commute to and from my high school. Now all these uh, elevators are shut down because of safety issues. Some of these carts, uh, they fill up the... The, the rail, so <laughs> they have to shut them down. Um, so the first place I landed here in the United States was uh, in New Jersey. And uh, uh, I started working at Rutgers University uh, and I worked with Dr. Stephen Wagner. Uh, it's a picture of him now, uh, who is uh, very well known by his contribution in the development of cardiovascular physiology, studying myocardium and ischemic preconditioning among, among other things. I recently learned that he was a postdoc fellow here at UW, and uh, his mentor, one of his mentors was uh, Dr. Van Kitters, uh, uh, who was uh, the dean of the School of Medicine in the 70s. And he was a pioneer of the, actually, um, the School of Medicine and also um, uh, uh, Cardiology Fellowship. Also, Dean Franklin was another of his mentors uh, at UW. Dean Franklin is very famous in the cardiac physiology world because he was the creator of the ultrasonic uh, flow meter which allow a lot of uh, research in the uh, 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 arterial flow, different areas of, of the body. Here's a picture of uh, Dr. Vande on the left when he was uh, younger and Dean Franklin, they were in Kenya. Um, and as you see here, it's uh, important to keep your fellows very well hydrated and entertained between uh, experiments to keep the productivity. So they were not just having fun in Kenya, but they were also studying the giraffe, cardiovascular physiology, uh, interesting here, the giraffe's map, 
is around 200 millimeter mercury. That's why this model is considered as a natural model of hypertension. So this was most of the work that they did together it was uh, the development of the remote cardiovascular monitoring, which allowed to understand the cardiovascular physiology in alive and conscious uh, animals, which can be translated into human cardiovascular research later on. So the, the goals of this presentation is uh, to understand the rationale uh, of adenocyclase 5. I'm gonna to refer to it as AC5. Uh, the inhibition of this, inhibition of this uh, protein is a potential target to treat heart failure and reperfusion injury. The other thing also we're gonna discuss is all the preclinical data uh, that uh, we have available right now. Everything is published by now uh, in AC5 inhibition and the potential molecular mechanisms that mediate these effects. And also we're gonna discuss about all the future uh, uh, directions that this uh, project can take. It is widely known by all of us uh, in the cardiology uh, world that an important part of the uh, heart failure pathophysiology is the autonomic dysfunction, which is characterized by a sympathetic activation that leads to catecholamine overload and in the, that in the cardiomouse side initially uh, increases the uh, contractility uh, in the short term, but in the long run, it activates pathways that lead to cell death and cardiac remodeling which eventually leads to worsening heart failure and poor outcomes. We know for many years now that the beta-1 receptor blockers, which are the uh, beta-1 receptors, um, which are the most commonly expressed in uh, catecholamine receptor in the heart, has a notorious benefit that translates into better, better outcomes in patients with heart failure, making this treatment an essential part of the contemporary heart failure regimen. However, the beta blockers are not free of uh, side effects. How about instead of blocking the beta receptor af here, we block a downstream target on the same pathway, for example, at the level of AC or adenine cyclist, which is in charge of, a, which is in sign that is in charge of catalyzing the conversion between from ATP into cyclic AMP, which is the second messenger that activates, activates down, the downstream pathway starting from PKA. And this activation leads to uh, contractility and activation of also pathways that are lethal for the cardiomyocyte. side. By doing so, by blocking the AC, we might be able to be more cardiac specific, avoiding side effects from non, non beta receptor, from non cardiac beta receptor blockade with the current beta blockers that we have um, available in the market and in the clinical practice. So in regards to adenine cyclists, um, there are nine transmembrane isoforms and one soluble isoform down here. All isoform itself for, except for isoform eight are detected in the heart, but the mostly expressed in the heart are the isoform five and six. Okay. These are public, publicly available data from PubMed gene. This is the RNA seq data from human tissue. All the tissues were collected and they measure the AC5 expression. And as you see here, AC5 is broadly expressed in most of the organs, but it's mostly expressed in the heart. And the much lower, much lower uh, expression level is in the brain and in the prostate. In the brain uh, has been reported that AC5 has some role in um, pain uh, control and probably Parkinson has, something, uh, has some role as well. In the prostate, nobody knows what the role of AC5 is. AC6, which is the other one that is highly expressed in the heart, is mostly expressed in the, in the fat and in the heart. And, but it's, uh, as you see here, the distribution of the AC6 expression is more, uh, is most, more, more widely, ex widely expressed in other organs than AC5. So an interesting question arises, why does the heart express two AC isoforms that are quite similar and seem to do the same thing, which is, converting ATP into cyclic AMP. In fact, they share around 65% of the amino acid sequence. Well, there are published data that suggest that AC5 is mostly expressed in the adult heart and mostly in the cardiomyocyte. side. On the other side, AC6 seems to be more expressed during the cardiac development and then gradually decrease with age and is pre predominantly expressed in non cardiomyocyte side in the heart. Also, there are some findings that suggest that AC5 and AC6 are located in different microdomains of the cardiomyocyte, making them functionally distinctive. 
So over the years, in order to understand the role of AC5 and AC6 in the heart, a series of genetically modified mice models have been created, including mice that overexpress or are knocked out for these AC isoforms. Before we dive into the data that we show you next, I have to explain this. Forskolin is a non-selective AC stimulator, meaning that it stimulates the AC, all AC isoforms, and isoprotenol also it stimulates AC by indirectly and it's via beta receptor. And as uh, you might remember uh, from uh, uh, pharmacology classes in med school, or probably from more recently, isoprotenol uh, activates both beta one and beta two, okay? Uh, since in the heart we have mostly AC5 and AC6, the cyclic AMP production observed in the cardiomyocytes mouse sites that are exposed to either forskolin or isoprotenol are assumed to come from mostly AC5 and AC6. So all the experiments that we do in isolated cardiomyocytes sites or cell, uh, cardiomyocyte site membrane looking at cyclic, cyclic AMP production that we'll show you in the next slices are with either uh, um, um, are with either of these stimulators. And the reason is because the baseline cyclic AMP production is very small and it's very difficult to pick difference with the current available biochemical assays. So I'm gonna start with the AC5 overexpressing mice. So the AC5 overexpressing mice should feature consistent with a more catecholamine sensitive heart as expected. The AC5 overexpressing cardiomyocytes have more cyclic AMP production upon the non-specific adenine cycle stimulation with forskolin than the wild type. These are two lineages of AC5 overexpressing mice and they both have more cyclic AMP production versus the no transgenic mice. These transgenic mice also have an increase in baseline contractility uh, measured by fraction shortening. And their heart rate also was faster than the wild type. So everything indicating that they were more catecholamine sensitive than the wild type mice. And the catecholamine overload using a chronic infusion of isoprotenol, which is a known uh, 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 drug that induces heart failure in the long run, is a known also heart failure model. The AC5 mice, uh, AC5 overexpressive mice were more prone to develop worse heart failure than the wild type, which was shown here. Uh, by a worsening ejection fraction decline in the AC5 overexpressing mice versus the wild type mice. Plus they also have more remodeling, which was represented by more fibrosis and also they have more uh, apoptosis than the wild type. The AC5 overexpressing mice had downregulated the manganese superoxide, which is a data that I'm not showing on this uh, 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 slide. So manganese superoxide is a natural antioxidant. Okay, so these mice, they have downregulated this natural antioxidant. The possibility that the AC5 overexpressing mice were more sensitive to oxidative stress was a, possible, uh, was a, was a, uh, um, was a potential mechanism that mediates uh, the, more, uh, the worst heart failure in the setting of isoprotenol uh, exposure. So along these lines, uh, this negative cardiac phenotype of serving the AC5 overexpressing mice was rescued by the overexpression of manganese superoxide by cross, uh, crossing transgenic mice for AC5 and also with mice that uh, uh, had overexpression of manganese superoxide. So we ended up having mice with both manganese superoxide and AC5 overexpression, and those mice were rescued. The ejection fraction decline was pretty much the same as the wild type, fibrosis also the same thing, and the apoptosis is the same thing. Another feature that was being described in the AC5 overexpressing mice, which goes along with a more catecholamine sensitive uh, um, phenotype, is that these mice are more prone to arrhythmias. As you see here on the right bottom of the, of the, of the screen, uh, these are wild type mice, their electrocardiogram, as you see, their baseline heart rate is in the 450s. And when you put them on isoprotein intravenous infusion, the heart rate speaks up. Um, which is a natural response, a chronotropic response to, to um, a beta-1 um, agonism from isoprotenol. The AC5 overexpressing mice, their heart rate at baseline is already faster as uh, we saw up here. 
And when the when you expose these mice to intravenous isoproteinol, they start throwing PVCs and eventually they go into lethal uh, uh, arrhythmias such as uh, polymorphy VT, as you see down here. On the other side, on the other spec, uh, side of the spectrum, the AC5 knockout mice showed mostly the opposite feature compare, compared to the AC5 expressed in mice. The left ventricle homogenate has less cyclic, cyclic AMP production at baseline um, after the, cyclic, uh, the AC stimulation with the water soluble forcecoline. Uh, here, the cyclic AMP production was lower than the wild type. So, as you see here, at baseline, the cyclic AMP production, the AC5 knockout was less than in the, the wild type. And after the exposure to the, this forcefully like drug, the cyclic AMP production was uh, blocked significantly compared to the wild type mice. On the top right panel, you can see that the cyclic AMP production in isolated chiral mouse site from AC5 knockout mice in black circles had a lower response to isoproteinol compared to the wild type litter mate, as expected. It works such as, it works a little bit like a beta blocker. On the bottom panels, um, uh, which are experiment in isolated perfused hearts versus control mice, you can see that the AC5 knockout mice hearts, uh, the, uh, the HABA is increasing the contractility, which this is a little bit unexpected. The contractility uh, measured by uh, positive DPDT, which is a measurement of contractility of the heart, is higher in the AC5 knockout versus the wild type mice. But their response to the, anotrop uh, the their anotropic response to dobutamine is blunted. Uh, uh, it's a little bit more blunted compared to the to the wild type mice. They begin they began with a higher contractility uh, measured by the uh, uh, pressure in the LV but the response doesn't go as high um, um, as the wild type does. Additionally, in vivo experiments have shown again that the AC5 knockout mouse displays a relatively blunt response to isoproteinol infusion compared, this is the AC5 knockout mice compared to the wild type. So AC5 knockout it um, shows feature very similar to uh, what would be, be, would be expected with beta blockers. Um, the only difference is that the uh, um, contractility seems to be higher at baseline compared to, to the wild type, which is a little bit unexpected. Um, in mice that uh, were subjected to transverse uh, aortic contriction, which is, um, I will refer from now as TAC, which is a, a well-established model of pressure overload, like hypertension induced heart failure, showed that three weeks post-TAC surgery the wild type mice uh, had a decline in, ejection, in their ejection fraction compared to the sham operator. This is the wild type. I'm sorry, this is the banded, and this is the, the sham operator, and this is the wild group. On the other side, the AC5 knockout mice, their ejection fraction was preserved compared comparing the, the, the mice that had the tax surgery versus the sham operator. So the AC5 knockout was protective against uh, pressure overload, heart failure. Interestingly, um, the AC5 knockout didn't protect against the hypertrophy response. In pressure overload, the first response is carmelocyte hypertrophy. The AC5 knockout mice versus the wild type mice, they have the same cell size. But the AC5 knockout mice, they have less cell death uh, via uh, apoptosis. I'm not showing those data here, but that was uh, in, on the same paper. On the chronic catecholamine overload model using isoproteinol infusion, there was a, a um, um, which is another known um, uh, heart failure model in both the wild type in white and the knockout in, in black. Uh, they both had a decline in the rejection fraction uh, upon chronic isoproteinol infusion, uh, but the, the, the decline the wild in the knockout mice was less compared to the wild type. So. Um, the AC5 knockout also protected against the catecholamine overload um, model. And on the same paper also, again, they found that cell death via apoptosis was less in the, in the knockout mice versus the wild type mice. So um, um, AC5 knockout is a cardioprotective um, um, genetic modification. So far, the studies on the AC5 knockout mice model 
uh, showed a broad array of uh, other healthy features, especially related to aging. For example, uh, the AC5 knockout mice showed or here on the kaplan mayer uh, graph on the left in black uh, on boxes, the AC5 knockout mice, they live longer than the wild type littermate. The medium lifespan was increased by eight months. Okay, from 25 to 33 months. And at 30 months mark, 16% of the wild type mice versus 92% of the AC5 knockout mice were alive. Also the AC5 knockout showed protection against aging associated cardiomyopathy represented by, a, by less uh, cardiac hypertrophy. Here's a left ventricle, left ventricle weight over uh, body weight. So the higher the number, more hypertrophy. And you see that the AC5 knockout, old AC5 knockout mice, they have less uh, hypertrophy. Also, they have more preserved ejection fraction, the AC5 knockout, and they have less apoptosis. And finally, they have less fibrosis than the wild type um, litter mate. So AC5 um, um, knockout also confer resistant against uh, oxidative stress. On this uh, experiment, this group showed that cell viability on neonatal, neonatal my, uh, myocytes and fibroblasts uh, uh, was increased in the knockout mice uh, in the setting of uh, uh, oxidative stress induced by either hydrogen peroxide or ultraviolet treatment. So as you see here, at different degrees, of hydrogen peroxide in a neonatal myocyte or embryonic fibroblast, the AC5 knockout my, uh, cells, they have more viability than the wild type uh, uh, cells. The same thing happened with the hydrogen peroxide. And uh, uh, they also showed that th there was less cell death via apoptosis in the AC5 knockout in, um, upon exposure to either ultraviolet or hydrogen peroxide in embryonic fibroblasts or adult fibroblasts, as you see here on the top. And this might be explained by the upregulation of the endogenous antioxidant that we talked earlier of, which is called manganese superoxide, which was found upregulated in the AC5 mice in different tissues here, you see in the heart, in the brain and in the kidneys. So the AC5 knockout seems to protect the, the mice from oxidative stress, especially during the aging, and, and might be uh, via uh, an upregulation of the manganese and superoxide that we're talking about here. So this paper is uh, more complex than uh, what I present. They focus on the, on the heart, but also they show uh, data on osteoporosis and some other features and diseases that are associated with aging. But in general terms, the hypothesis that was postulated by Dr. Badness group on this paper on how AC5 knockout protects against aging related complications is as follows. In the AC5 knockout, since they don't have AC5, there is a decrease in the cyclic AMP production and therefore less active PKA, which releases the break to the RAF1 mech erc pathway. So this leads to the activation of the pro-survival mech erc pathway that leads to the uh, increase in the expression of manganese superoxide. So erc, when erc is activated, with, if, when it's phosphorylated, it's active. And when it's active, if it can be translocated into the nuclear, uh, nucleus and can activate, uh, can work as a, as a transcription factor and or can also activate all the transcription, fact, transcription factors and it can lead to an increase in the expression of uh, pro-survival uh, proteins. In further studies, screening for potential compounds using com computer computational modeling, uh, looking for compounds that might inhibit AC5, an old drug called Vidarabine, Vidarabine or RIA came up. So RIA is already FDA approved to treat herpes encephalitis but it is not available in the market anymore because it was replaced by a more effective antiviral, antiviral drug, which is a cycle of all of us, we are familiar with this drug, but none of us probably know about this RIA except for me probably. Um, 
So in order to test the specificity of RIA as an AC5 inhibitor, we carry out experiment utilizing cardiomyocyte membranes exposed to either force cooling or isoproteinol to increase the cyclic, cyclic AMP production uh, using um, membranes from uh, isolated from different um, genetically modified mice, including the AC, uh, wild type, AC5 knockout, AC5 overexpressing or transgenic, or AC, and AC6 transgenic mice. As you see here on these uh, two graphs, the inhibition of cyclic A and pre production in the AC5 overexpressing mice was the most striking. However, the cyclic AMP production was also attenuated in the wild type because they also have AC5, and in the AC6 also because they also have AC5. But you don't see any cyclic AMP production inhibition in the AC5 knockout. So this data suggests that RIA is fairly specific for AC5 over AC6, okay? Um, so in the previous experiment, we're talking about membranes. So it, since it, it is important to see if a drug can do the same thing if the cell is exposed um, uh, to a compound from the extracellular space. We tried the same experiments on isolated caramelocytes and we found exactly the same thing. We found that the AC5 transgenic mice, they have a decrease in the cyclic AMP production more markedly than um, AC6 and uh, wild type, but AC6 and the wild type also they have a decrease in the cyclic, and we didn't see any change in the cyclic change in the cyclic AMP production in the AC5 knockout. Again, supporting the hypothesis that uh, RIA seems to be a very um, fairly specific for AC5 over AC6. Um, from in vivo studies, uh, we learned that wild type mice that were receiving RIA or placebo, uh, or in this case we call it vehicle, they have a similar inotropic response to this isoproteinol at different doses, dosages. And on the other hand, to compare with a non compound metoprolol, metoprolol practically planted the inotropic response. Um, on the AC5 overexpressing mice, the anotropic response to isoproteinol was attenuated compared to the vehicle treated. And on the AC6 transgenic, there was, I, I wouldn't see any effect from um, RIA in terms of uh, anotropic uh, response to isoproteinol, isoprote, um, yeah, isoproteinol. Again, supporting the fact that RIA seems to be uh, fairly specific for AC5 over AC6. And AC6, as I said, is the most similar isoform to AC5. Um, yeah. Uh, so the next step was, in order to evaluate the role of AC5 in ischemic homopathy, we measured uh, the AC5 protein expression using Western blood for, uh, in the heart uh, of mice that underwent LED ligation, which is a known um, model to induce ischemic cardiomyopathy. And we found that the AC5 uh, protein amount was significantly increased in the heart from the mice with ischemic cardiomyopathy. And the amount of AC5 was significantly higher in the area that was adjacent, immediately adjacent to the main scar. And, but it was also increased in the remote area. That, that's the area that's opposite to where the uh, scar is. Uh, compared to the sham operated uh, mice. Therefore, if the upregulation of AC5 is maladaptive, the AC5 inhibition might render benefit. So in order to test if AC5 inhibition with RIA might have a clinical role, we tested the effects of RIA in the ischemic homopathy model by complete ligation of the LAD uh, in mice. And we found that the inhibition, that the pharmacologic inhibition of AC5 here in black line was associated with a better survival post myocardial infarction, as you see here on the Kaplan Mai on the left, compared to the RIA treated, which is here, the, this continuous line here. Additionally, this survival, survival benefit was eliminated um, by the uh, use of the MEC uh, inhibitor U0126. Among the survivors um, at this uh, time point, at the 21 uh, day post-MI, uh, 
Um, the echocardiogram showed that the ejection fraction was significantly better in the RIA treated mice, and the benefit seemed to be abolished by the use of the MEK inhibitor, uh, the U0126, uh, versus the vehicle treated. And here you have a sham group as a reference group to see what the normal ejection fraction in a mice look like, looks like. Um, keep in mind on this analysis, the survival bias on this analysis, it is possible that we're picking the best ejection fraction of each group. So probably the, all those numbers are lower uh, if uh, we uh, get it uh, earlier, uh, earlier stage on the follow-up. On the bottom uh, panel, you see that the mice treated with the AC5 inhibitor had less interstitial fibrosis. Here on this sustaining, yellow is normal tissue and red is fibrosis. Um, on the right panel here, you see that the adjacent area to the main impact, the fibrosis was uh, decreased by the use of RIA versus vehicle. And this uh, reduction on the uh, adjacent fibrosis was uh, um, attenuated by the MEK inhibitor in adjacent and the, in the remote area. So this data indicates that RIA has a cardioprotective effect in the ischemic cardiomyopathy model, and it is MEK pathway dependent. Um, here we have some um, pro, uh, um, 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 Western blood data. Here on the left panel, you can see that the infusion alone of RIA was associated with an increase in the cardiac phosphorylation of MEK and ERK. You see here, increase in MEK, ERK phosphorylation, which represent an increase in the activity of this pathway. To remind you what I said earlier, so upon, upon a phosphorylation of the ERK, um, what happens, ERK is translocated into the nucleus and can activate transcription factors that can promote cell survival pathways. On the right side of the right on the right side of the screen, uh, you can see now we have drug infusion plus the mice. So the mice were subjected to the mice plus they received the drug, and you can see again that RIA uh, was associated with an increase in the um, phosphorylation of MEK ERK uh, on the MEK uh, ERK pathway, and the uh, MEK inhibitor. It didn't change the uh, phosphorylation of MEK, but it decreased the phosphorylation of ERK and ERK as expected. And the, um, the use of the MEK ERK alone without anything else didn't change the phosphorylation of, uh, of MEK ERK pathway. So the next step on this project was to look at the ischemia reperfusion model, which mimics those patients with STEMI that are successfully revascularized nowadays with PCI. It has been shown that the myocardial damage in this scenario is due to two hits the ischemia itself on one side and the reperfusion on the other side. The current revascularization strategies are very successful on treating the ischemia part, but we currently lack treatment for the reperfusion injury. So the idea of this part of the project was to see if the AC5 inhibition has any benefit or room to treat the reperfusion injury that as I, as I uh, just mentioned, we lack of treatment. For this model, what we do is we put the mice, uh, the mouse, it's, uh, one mouse uh, under anesthesia, and then via thoracotomy, we perform an LED ligation that is released after a short period of time, typically around 30 to 60 uh, minutes, depending on the, on the mice strain that you're working with. Then the mouse is recovered and sacrificed uh, 24 hours later. Uh, as you see here, they ha they, they're having a STEM here, ST elevation. Uh, then the heart is collected, and we use triple phase staining called Asian Blue and TTC. Uh, so this picture I took it from uh, from another uh, paper. It's a it's a little bit uh, uh, edited. Um, so this is supposed to be blue, uh, but here is black, so you can see more clearly the differences. Uh, the black area represents uh, the remote area, which is not perfused by the coronary artery that was ligated. It has nothing to do with the LAD. Um, the white area uh, is the necrotic area, the area that all the cells uh, died from the, from the lack of oxygen and nutrients. Uh, 
uh, from ischemia. And um, the, the red area is uh, the risk area. So it's the area that received blood supply from, from the LED that was ligated, the cold pre-vessel, but uh, the ischemia wasn't long enough to cause uh, um, necrosis in this area. Okay. If you keep the ligation in the LED, uh, eventually you're going to have, everything is going to be necrotic here and you're going to have the remote areas. So you're going to have only two areas, the remote and the scar uh, tissue. So in order to evaluate if the AC5 knockout mice was protected against ischemia and reperfusion injury, we subjected the cardiac specific AC5 knockout mice to ischemia and reperfusion. And at this point, we had available the cardiac specific. So we started doing experiment with the AC cardiac specific AC5 knockout mice. And we found that the AC5 knockout mouse had a significantly smaller impact size compared to the wild type litter mate. And the administration of the AC5 inhibitor did not confer any additional impact size reduction. So the, the AC5 was uh, protected as we expected. So, sorry. So the next question was whether the AC5 inhibitor would be capable of reproducing this cardioprotective phenotype seen on the AC5 knockout mouse in the setting of ischemia and reperfusion injury. So we found that those mice that received chronic um, infusion of the AC5 inhibitor given via osmotic pump reduced the infact size. However, the infact size reduction appeared to be more marked when the drug was intravenously infused for five minutes prior to the reperfusion, uh, uh, reperfusion of the coronary artery. I mean, in, in other words, the mice were going through ischemia. Five minutes before reperfusion, we started the infusion and then we finished the infusion and we opened the coronary artery. But the biggest uh, impact size reduction was achieved when the drug was given within the first minutes post reperfusion. So we opened the coronary artery and then we uh, so using ANOVA and Bonferroni post-hoc analysis, this is the, we found that this impact size reduction was the, the most significant compared to the other subgroups. And it's about 50%. On the right side of the screen, you can see a representative slice of mice hearts using TTC staining as we discussed earlier. So you can see that the necrotic area of these hearts is uh, uh, significantly smaller compared to the vehicle treated. This is the RIA treated and this is the vehicle treated. It was published a few years ago. Um, so in order to evaluate if ERK was also mediating this uh, cardioprotective feature of the ACV, AC5 blockade, we measured the ratio of phosphorylated versus non-phosphorylated ERK. So the higher is the number, the more active the pathway is. Because remember the phosphorylation of make ERK pathway uh, means activation of the pathway. And we found that ERK-1-2 uh, phosphorylation was clearly increased in the heart from mice that were treated with, uh, with a brief five minutes of the AC5 in, in, in inhibitor. Uh, those mice were not subjected to ischemia, they only received the drug, but we found that the phosphorylation of ERK was increased in the RA treated versus the wild type, as you see here. And then we gave uh, the MEC uh, inhibitor U0126 uh, prior to the RIA infusion. As you see here, the impact size was reduced by RIA. And then we gave the MEC inhibitor prior to RIA infusion and the impact size reduction was eliminated uh, by blocking the MEC pathway. So taken together, it means that the AC5 blocker reduced the impact size and it's also MEC ERK pathway as we've seen in previous uh, studies consistently. So now trying to move closer to the clinical, um, to, to, the, to the bedside, uh, you know, to be, to be able to evaluate if this drug works uh, in a large animal model is an important uh, um, aspect in order to move closer to the human applicability of this pharmacological treatment. Pig's heart uh, circulation is more closely uh, link, uh, uh, related to the human uh, circulation. So getting closer to the human uh, physiology, uh, I think is, uh, is very helpful um, in order to, to, to see if this drug might help in the clinical practice. And Dr. Steven Wagner labs, uh, the conscious instrumented swine model has been extensively studied. So this big model is made by surgically implanted cardiac sensors that can record pressures and flows among other variables. We can also place uh, this occluder around the LED that can later on be inflated uh, 
and cause uh, uh, infraction distal to this area. And, um, and after this surgery, it's an open heart surgery, um, we let the pig recover. And then we do all these experiments with the pig wide, uh, wide awake. Um, so we induce ischemia, uh, we give some sedation for pain, uh, uh, some uh, sedation and so some pain medication to control, to help them with the pain management. Sometimes they go into arrhythmias, including VT. Sometimes we have to do CPR to the pigs to keep them alive. Um, and I think that this was uh, the, the biggest part of my, my research at Dr. Badner's lab. And, um, and it was a, a great experience working in this animal model. Um, these pigs so were subject to 60 minutes of ischemia followed by three hours of reperfusion, then sacrifice. We found again that the infarct size was, was decreased by the administration of the AC5 inhibitor during the reperfusion period. It is important to know that the infarct size reduction now that we observe in this model was more modest than the one that we observed in the mass model. Uh, on the right side is on the screen of your screen, you see a representative pig heart slice that showed that the necrotic tissue in the uh, mass um, was markedly small in the RIA treated pigs versus the vehicle treated. So the white area here is the necrotic area. And as you see in the vehicle, seems to be larger. So further attempts have been made to develop a more potent than already available AC5 inhibitor after I left Dr. Batten's lab. And I, I went into my clinical training. Um, along those lines, uh, C C90 was uh, made and on isolated caramel sites membrane, it was found that the cyclic AMP production induced by forscolin was significantly decreased uh, by C90 in the wild type mice. Um, around 40% of uh, cyclic AMP production uh, was uh, decreased. Uh, and in the AC5 knockout caramel site, the cyclic AMP production was already decreased compared to the wild type and the exposure to C90 didn't decrease it further, which again supports that this drug is fairly uh, specific. Five. Additionally, using dose response experiments in, um, in wild type chiomal sites, C90 showed an at least 30 time, 37 times lower IC50 uh, than RIA and five times lower than PMC6, as you see here. PMC6 is another drug that also has some AC5 inhibition properties. Um, so this indicates that this new compound, C90, uh, is more potent because you need a much lower dose of C90 to achieve the same 50% inhibition, inhibition of the cyclic AMP production versus RIA, uh, which is Vidalabine as well, uh, or PMC6. Similar to the prior experiments with RIA, C90 also decreased the impact size in mice model, as you see here. This is an uh, area at risk, so the, 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 the risk area um, over the left ventricle. So this is uh, typically uh, used to, um, to give a reference that the area of ligation of the LED is uh, pretty much at the same level in all the mice. Um, and this is impact over area at risk. Um, as you see here, the, uh, the administration of C90 at uh, reperfusion uh, time decreases the impact size more than 50%. And uh, the interesting thing about this is when the drug was given even after 10 minutes into reperfusion, the drug still was working, which we didn't see in RIA. In RIA, uh, after 10 minutes into reperfusion, uh, we didn't see any cardioprotection. Most of the protection was gone. And finally, we use uh, the Watanabe uh, um, rabbit model, which is a well-established spontaneous atherosclerosis model, rabbit model, due to a genetic uh, hyperlipidemia, trying to mimic more closely to what happened to people with coronary disease. Because the mice, they have normal coronary arteries, and we put a ligation in the LED. But people with uh, coronary disease, they typically have a more diffuse disease. So that's why the Watanabe rabbit model is important in these kind of studies. And we found again a 50% impact site reduction with C90 uh, when it was given within the reperfusion time. Um, so con uh, conclusions and limitations. Um, um, so AC5 appears to be a promising novel target to treat heart failure and reperfusion injury based on all the data that I presented. 
there are still a lot of uh, uh, debate regarding uh, whether AC5 uh, knockout or inhibition is the, the best way to treat heart failure or is AC6 um, upregulation uh, because there are some, this is another group, Dr. Hammond's uh, group, uh, he's uh, in San Diego. Um, they have reported that heart failure is associated with AC6 depletion. And therefore, if you increase the AC6, you might be able to rescue heart failure. And he's shown some, some data on mice and also a pig model. And actually he's uh, running a clinical trial, it's called Florist, uh, in which they're planning to give um, AC6, I mean, the, the, the plan to uh, infect uh, the heart with the, the gene to, to code AC6. And by doing that, they plan to increase the AC6 expression in the heart of people with heart failure. So this is a topic of the, a still active debate. Um, also, in order to move to the clinical practice or the clinical applica applicability of this uh, compound, um, we need to do the formal pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic, and toxicity studies in large animal and phase one clinical trial, and then move on to a phase two clinical trial. And uh, the data that we have so far uh, indicates that RIA and C90 are fairly specific for AC5. However, now we don't have an isolated system in which we have only AC5 um, and, and which we can give the drug and see the drug uh, interact directly with the, with the protein and by doing so decrease the cyclic AMP production. And also we don't have the crystallographic images to look at the interaction between those. In other words, we don't know if uh, RIA or C90 inhibits ACE5 via another uh, mediator. We've, we have some data uh, that have shown that inhibition of uh, some specific um, adenosine receptors might inhibit, I mean, it inhibits uh, the cardioprotection from RIA. And um, also we can't, from the data that I, I show you, we can't exclude that AC5 inhibitors don't have any other effect in any other target. And the future directions of the study. Um, so now, in, especially in the heart failure world, we are dealing with a lot of um, uh, um, uh, patients with RV, I wouldn't say a lot, but a significant number of patients with ELVA that develop RV failure and RV failure is a big uh, issue because now we don't have any uh, medical treatment available other than ion drop to support. Um, but the, the treatment is transplant and transplant is a limited resource and a, a percentage of people with ELVA that are no transplant candidates. So they, are, they get stuck on this situation. So the development of medical treatment for RV failure is key. So my next uh, plan is to measure the AC5 expression, the RV of people with ELVA and RV failure and we apply for a grant for this and hopefully we can get it funded and move forward with this uh, research study. Um, the other thing also is, uh, uh, is, uh, is interesting is all this finding in ischemic cardiomyopathy. So I think the next step is to do to the, all the pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic, toxic, uh, toxicology studies in preclinical studies and also phase one and then move on to four, phase two clinical trial and see if this drug works in the, uh, patient, in the patients uh, with have ref um, and uh, hopefully can add some benefit uh, on top of the treatment options that we have available right now. And lastly, we saw that this drug works in the uh, ischemia reperfusion injury. And I, I think the, the main role of this drug is uh, the protection against uh, re uh, reperfusion injury. And so the next goal will be to see if this drug is effective in people with the STEMI uh, um, and uh, whether we can see an impact size reduction in patients having a STEMI by measuring either the ear under the curve with the cardiac enzymes or cardiac MRI. That's uh, something also we have in mind doing down the road. <laughs>